Easter could have changed your life. Sadly, it only changed your day. Let's not let that happen here, all right? <clears throat> the resurrection. Is it a rational hope that we carry in our hearts? Or is it just wishful thinking for people who are self-deceived? I'd like you to take your Bibles and join me in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Let's read one of the historical passages that point us to the resurrection of our Savior. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 15. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 15. We know that Jesus, Good Friday, was killed, hung on a cross, died, taking the sins of the world upon him. He descended into hell, and he was left in the tomb. And verse 1 says, Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, and he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white like snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. I'm just saying if you were paying attention there. because <laughs> Matthew says it a different way. As he said, come, see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, where you will see him. See, I have told you. So the woman departed quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Well, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest. All of the guard? No. How many of the guards? Some of the guard. They went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave uh, a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ear, rather than have you killed, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And that story has been spread amongst the Jews even to this day. Well, it's estimated that the number of Christians in the world that are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus uh, this year has quadrupled in the last hundred years from 600 million in 1914 to well over 2 billion along with us this year. About a third of the world's population. Granted, the numbers are estimates, but still, <laughs> that's a lot of souls expressing their belief in an event that only could have occurred because God willed it so. The question that plagued me for part of my life is, is it true? 
Why do I believe that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, and then came back to life according to him, rejoined God his Father in heaven? To believe a story like that would take some degree of informed convincing. I did know a good number of extremely bright people that I suspected uh, and that I that, that suspected they believed and I respected them greatly. And that in and of itself told me that the question was worth pursuing. So I did, as have many others for millennia. So where did I look? The first thing I did, and we're not going to have time to do that this morning, we've done it a number of times here at Walnut Hill, is check into the authenticity of this book. Can this book be trusted? What makes this book different than every other book that was ever written? What makes this book different from every other piece of literature that has been passed down through the years at about the same time when the various portions of this book were being written. Are there any other documents that have been preserved as accurately as what you find in this book? And the answer is no. And, and, and it's not even close in terms of the accuracy from when these letters were first written and what we have in our hands today. But I'd like to talk a little bit about prophecy this morning. If I tell you this coming year the Brewers are going to win the World Series. And they're going to be up by ten and a half games in their division at the end of the season. And they're going to sweep every game of the playoff. And then they do. You're going to have a different opinion of me at the end of the year. <laughs> right? Right? And then if I do that every year for the next ten years before I stop letting you make all the money that you're pocketing at my behalf, that would really get your attention, right? Well, distinct aspects of the ancestry and the birth and the life and the ministry and the death of the Messiah were all prophesied in the Old Testament many hundreds of years before they occurred, and their historical fulfillment was recorded in the New Testament, and they are still being fulfilled in the world today. But most of what we look at is in the four gospel accounts. Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus' resurrection, though, are not given with the same clarity as other aspects of his life and ministry, which sometimes were given in tremendous detail. If you've ever read some of Notre Dame's prophecies and been impressed by his prophecies, uh, his prophecies were very, very general in nature and could have been fulfilled a number of different ways. But not so the prophecies of Jesus. Old Testament resurrection prophecies are numerous, but the ones pinning them to Jesus and Jesus alone are not as crystal clear as we would like them to be. This may be why his own disciples seem confused immediately after his death. Jesus had certainly predicted his resurrection and his own words proved true and more than able to convince them of his victory over death. But they were confused by the resurrection. We remember a conversation recorded in John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. And it says, So the Jews said to Jesus, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them this way. He said, Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. And then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But Jesus wasn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem. The resurrection itself explains Jesus' sign that he would give. And this is a sign to us also. And we can see it with clarity in hindsight. 
when Jesus spoke of the temple, that place where the Holy Spirit of the living God resided, he was talking about his own physical body. He would be killed. He would be destroyed. And in three days, he would rise up alive again from the tomb. The Jewish men who queried him assumed he was speaking of Herod's temple, but he was not. In Mark chapter 9, verses uh, 30 and 32, they, Jesus and his disciples, went on from there, passing through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, in other words, he wanted time with his disciples. He didn't want to be inundated with the crowds. Uh, but he told his disciples, he said, the Son of Man, and that was a title that he loved for himself, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But guess what? After Jesus said that, the text says they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask. By the way, if anybody hears anything in this place this morning, anything the choir sang, anything Tyson says, anything in a sermon I say, and you don't understand, please don't be afraid to ask. Ask one of your Christian friends, and if they're scratching their heads, call the church. Ask me. Ask Pastor Dan. Ask Pastor Jim. Ask one of the elders, okay? Bob, raise your hand. Ask him. He knows, okay? Ask these guys. That's what we pay him so much for. <laughs> In heaven, right, Bob? All right. <laughs> Jewish biblical scholar Alfred Eidersheim lived between 1825 and 1889, and he was a convert to Christianity. And he wrote a classic work affirming that were, there were 456 messages in the Old Testament that refer to the Messiah. His work called The Life and Times of Jesus, the Messiah, is accessible for free online. Eidersheim also stated that there are 558 messianic references in Jewish rabbin rabbinic writings. In other words, not just the Bible, but even more in the rabbinical writings of the Jewish people themselves. Popular apologist Josh McDowell inspired a generation of Christians to become interested in prophecy fulfillment by detailing numerous prophecies in his bestseller, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. That book is available in our office, and I have a copy, and Pastor Dan has a copy. Anybody else here have a copy of Evidence Demands a Verdict? Yeah, number of hands. Now you know what generation you're part of if you raise your hand. <laughs> Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was an atheist with a degree in journalism from Missouri State University, and he had a deg law degree from Yale. He worked as the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune for 14 years. With a chip on his shoulder, he set out to debunk Christian claims regarding the basic foundational claims of Christianity. But in the process, he found that his assumptions couldn't stand up under the evidence, and he became a Christian. In his books... The Case for Christ and The Case for the Real Jesus, also available in the church library. Uh, he interviews two Jewish experts and converts to Christianity, Louis Lap Lapides and Dr. Michael Brown. They both give specific and helpful backgrounds concerning Old Testament predictions about the coming of the Messiah. And their discussions are helpful as you work through these questions. In fact, the case for the real Jesus, Brown establishes that either the Old Testament points towards Jesus the Messiah, or there will never be another Messiah. And he was primarily writing to his own people, the Jewish people, who some still waiting for the Messiah. And he says, this is it. There's not another one coming. In other words, Jesus fits the fingerprint of the Jewish prophecies in a manner that nobody else ever did or ever will be able to do in the future given the necessary time frame for the appearance of the Messiah. 
So we have prophecy. But you know what else we have? We have witnesses. You ever get in trouble with the law? And somebody's accusing you of one thing and you know it happened the other way? You better start to line up your witnesses. Not only do you want to line up witnesses, you want to line up trustworthy witnesses. So we look at the witnesses to what happened. And we ask ourselves, were these trustworthy people? Well, the first witnesses to the resurrection were the women, the Marys, if you will. You know, note the number of times the word see is mentioned in our text. You know, see, it's what witnesses do. They see things, right? The women went to the tomb to see the tomb, assuming it was still closed. But they saw that the tomb was empty. Do you ever wonder why the angel rolled the stone aside? Did Jesus need the stone rolled aside to get out? Jesus could have exited the tomb while the stone was still in place. He walked into rooms that were locked that the disciples were in after his resurrection. Is it possible that the only reason the stone had been rolled away was evidential? So that any one of the guards, the women, the disciples, anyone else could see that Jesus was no longer there, just his grave clothes. The angel's message indicated that the disciples could go and see Jesus meeting him in Galilee, alive. And then the last thing the angel said was, see, <laughs> I had told you, look. After the, after the women ran from the tomb, they saw Jesus in the garden. The other thing they did is they fell at his feet and they touched him. They touched him. Okay? He wasn't a figment of their imagination. These witnesses had physical interaction with the resurrected Jesus. And then Jesus also told the women that the disciples would see them in Galilee. The Roman guards. They saw the angel which caused them to tremble. This is a scene, you know, I'm just hoping when I get to heaven, there's this big, I don't know what kind of technology they have in heaven, but I'd love to see that scene, okay? When the angel appeared like lightning and the guards saw the angels and they began to tremble and then, and then it was like they were dead, okay? I don't know what that means exactly. I mean, did they pass out, okay? Will they just... You know, I, I don't know. You can't be like your dad while you're still trembling, though. So the trembling must have stopped eventually before they went down. I don't know. I really want to see that. But they, according to the text, not all of them, some of them, were paid hush money in order to keep them from telling others what they saw. Okay, so how did this story, get ver this story about the guards getting paid hush money there then get verified? Well, most likely some of them told. Okay. Matthew 28 records the gathering of the 11 apostles who went to Galilee and met Jesus on the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. It was there Jesus gave them the Great Commission, but a lot went on before that happened. Luke, the great physician and historian, recorded a meeting with Jesus and two of his disciples as they walked, to the, walked the road to the city of Emmaus. Emmaus. And they, there they conversed with Jesus, giving testimony of what others had seen regarding his resurrection. Jesus spent time with them, teaching them, and eating with them before vanishing from their sight. And they immediately returned back to Jerusalem to tell the 11 apostles of their encounter with Jesus, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon, as if to say, look, when Peter tells you he saw the empty tomb, he saw the empty tomb, guys. In Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 53, uh, we pick up right here where it left off, and it says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood amongst them, saying, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and they thought, and they thought that he was a spirit, 
And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands, my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, but, and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before him. It, it, you, the wording here is amazing. You know, it's like even though it was so real, it was still so hard to believe. That's where a lot of us are at, where some of us are at. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you, remind us still re remember that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You are what? You guys are witnesses of these things. Why did he say that? Because it's so blasted important that people believe and there need to be witnesses to tell the truth. Amen. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, reference to the Holy Spirit, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. They would stay there till Pentecost and the Holy Spirit would come upon them and empower them to do all that Jesus had told them that they must do. And after he said that, he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. They worshipped him with great joy, even though what they had just encountered was going to put them on a narrow track for the rest of their lives, and all but one of them would die a martyr's death. But the joy welled up within their hearts. John's account of the life of Jesus is equally compelling. John uh, recorded a number of interactions that the post-resurrection Jesus had with his disciples. But the one that stands out to me is in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, where John writes, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So that by believing you may have what? Life in his name. And it didn't even all get recorded. Lots more didn't get recorded. Paul was a citizen of Rome. He was also a Jewish Pharisee who studied under the respected rabbi Gamaliel. He was a non-believing, Christian-hating Jewish leader who persecuted Christians and oversaw the stoning execution of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Paul, as did thousands of Jewish people who were witnesses to the first century evidence, became a believer. And in a letter he penned to the church in Corinth, he wrote this, I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if it's conditional. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. In other words, these were all Christians, and they were standing firm together in Christ. But Paul thought, these reminders are good. So we better celebrate Easter, okay? And be reminded over and over again, not only at Easter time, but every time we take the Lord's Supper also. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, Old Testament prophecy, 
that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, which is a name that Jesus gave Peter, and then to the 12, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Why is this important to Paul? He is telling those who may doubt the resurrection that there are many eyewitnesses to these proofs. If you doubt, ask these people yourselves. They saw him. It is important. These are not simply fanciful stories that were manufactured so that those of us who continue to follow him do not lose face. Whose story was most readily believed? The guards who were paid to lie or the people who witnessed it? And if we remember, okay, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish people gave their life to Christ and were baptized. And for those who do believe that these early followers of Jesus just went along with the lie, so as not to embarrass themselves, please stop and think. Eleven of the twelve disciples died a martyr's death for something that they believed. You don't die a martyr's life for something you think is a lie. They lived the rest of their lives ridiculed, threatened, at sustenance levels of life's basic needs, and then they were killed, many of them tortured, and without wavering in their faith in Jesus. A person doesn't do that unless they truly believe, unless they're just crazy people. But when you think about the people that Christ commissioned to tell, people from all walks of life, okay, okay, businessmen, tax collectors, white collar, blue collar, women, men. Paul goes on to write, Jesus also appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, to an untimely born, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. You didn't know that Popeye quoted Paul, did you? Okay. And his grace towards me was not in vain. That's a good prayer for each of us. Lord, do not allow your grace expended towards me. The weight and the burden and the torture and the pain of my sin that you took upon the cross. Please don't let that be in vain. May my love and my service to you start to scratch what I owe you because of your great love for me. Paul says, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was for I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And then Paul goes on to say, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is in vain. It's worthless. And your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God. We're found to be lying at that point because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. And then he repeats, for if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still lost in your sin. And then those also who have fallen asleep, who have died in Christ, they have perished also. There's no resurrection for them. But if in Christ we have hope in this life only, and that's all there is, we are of all people most to be pitied. We're just a pitiful, 
bunch of self-deceived, ignorant people. Early in the service, we sang the song, The Bridge, and I made a copy of that for you, and I put it in your bulletins. Tyson did a wonderful job of walking us through it. O oh, bridge between earth and realms of heaven, and that's a reference to Jesus. O oh, word made flesh, the Lord in human form. See, he is the one that leads his flock across sin's gaping chasm. He is the shepherd of the sheep, and his sheep hear his voice, and they follow him. They don't follow him if they don't have faith in him, if they don't trust him. Their shelter from the deadly midnight storm is Jesus. The only way to reach the holy kingdom, from frigid night to daylight safe and warm. You know, everybody in this new room knows the condition of the world in which we live. Do you pay attention to the condition of the world in which we live? Do you see the lives that are lost every day because of man's inhumanity to man? Do you see the tyrants vying for power and wealth and using people as chattel, as their pawns in their games? Do you see the disease? Do you see the corruption? Do you see the addictions? Do you see the selfishness? Do you see the abuse? Do you see it, the darkness of this world around us? But we walk in light. <laughs> we do not live there. We live in Christ. On a higher ground that allows us to see what there is through the eyes of God. And we are a people of hope who have been put here to reach out to those who don't have him and help them follow Christ, bringing them the truth of the gospel. You see, you shine above all human vision like Jesus in radiant light upon your glorious throne, the Holy One, source of all truth, source of all beauty, who reigns supreme and in power, Jesus stands alone. You, Christ, raise us up <laughs> until you, until we, like you, become holy. And it's a process. Am I holy? Mostly. Yes, I am. I'm getting holy. I am holy. Because I'm becoming more like Jesus every day. I know some of you are thinking, Hutchins, you got a long way to go. I'm not going to argue with that. Jesus' righteousness for all my sin has atoned. Within your word, Father, creation is held together, and yet you far surpass all mortal dreams. The rift that exiles sinners from your presence Though it's infinite, it's less vast than it seems. For in one man, divine and human mingled, to bridge the gap, to bridge that gap between humanity and God by one dark cross's beams. On the back side of that sheet that I gave you is scripture that will walk you through the bridge. At the bottom of that sheet, there's a prayer. A prayer that can be prayed to express to God your heart. It's one of those prayers that if one prays it or something similar to it with the same, or with the same elements, uh, that's the first step, man. That is giving your heart to Christ. That is expressing your desire for forgiveness and your desire to follow him all the days of your life so that you can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm not big on saying mass prayers. I don't believe in incantations that if you say these words when you're done with the prayer and say amen, poof, you're a Christian. I don't believe in that. But those, it's a guide. And I would suggest you 
If you've never given your life to Christ, take that, read it. Walk through the scriptures and pray and ask God, ask God to help you understand. Ask God to give you light. Ask God to save your soul. Stand with me, would you please? Very quietly, very quietly as we begin. Ready? on your way out.